I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. What up, what up? This is your boy Rob Clark welcoming you to the 22 November Network. Get ready for another exciting edition of the Lone Gunman Podcast featuring me, that's right, your boy Rob Clark coming at you. Stay tuned. Be right there. What up, what up? Welcome to the Lone Gummin Podcast, episode number 32, The Redux. And I'll explain why it's a redux here in a minute. But first, let me first address a couple things. Uh, Number one, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for liking the podcast. Thank you for sharing the podcast. Thank you for commenting on the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Secondly, you may have noticed a more professional sounding opening. And that is thanks to Spreaker. They have upgraded their recording studio. And everything that I used to do in a (laughs) ghetto style with two phones and uh, external speakers, now... Is all integrated into one app and it makes me sound really professional, like I actually know what I'm doing. Uh, thirdly, any music you hear on the Lone Gummin podcast from here on out is going to have been composed by me. Yes, that fantastic opening music was composed by me for the exclusive use of the Lone Gummin podcast and Rob Clark. The reason for that is, of course, you know, I'd like for the show to grow and be featured in more places than just Spreaker. And in order for that to happen, I cannot use any licensed music on here without the written consent of the copyright holder. And to do that would be very very complicated and time consuming and really not worth the effort so I figured that I would through the miracle of modern technology compose my own music so any music you hear on here will have been composed by me and me alone now it's not as good as you know these professional artists but it's mine I'm still learning how to do it and I like it, man. You know, it's kind of got a cool groove to it. And uh, hopefully you like it too. So I'll have intro music and I'll have ending music. All of which composed by me, your boy Rob Clark. Right here. On the Lone Gunman Podcast. That out of the way. Alright, let's get right into the controversy. Okay? <laughs> um. So yeah, I had a... Uh, a bit of a complaint about the last podcast and I know for a fact about 90 of you got to listen to it and for those lucky 90 um, who did get the opportunity to listen to it it was uh, basically recapping a few of the speakers from the conference three of them to be exact uh, Ed Tatro, Bill Simpich and Richard Bartholomew and one in particular, and I won't call him out by name, but if you're smart, you can kind of figure it out. Had a problem with uh, the way I covered his presentation. And 
instead of arguing about it, and you know, instead of having a, getting into a pissing match with this particular person, I decided it best to just go ahead and delete the episode altogether. So, if you would like to know what Ed Tatro, uh, Bill Simpich, and Richard Bartholomew had to say at the conference, buy the DVD. That's all I can tell you. Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's like this. I'm not a professional journalist. I'm not even a prof- professional writer. I'm not a professional broadcaster. I'm just some dummy uh, with a recording device with an interest in the assassination and all, of the, all the events surrounding it and researching it, uh, you know, that, that decided to make a show about it, you know, because I have no one to talk to around me. Uh, it's a vehicle for me to dump my brain out into the ether and uh, create conversation about everything. And so, and so it goes, you know, Uh, when we were at the conference, me and Doug were mainly concentrating on a couple different things instead of us both being at at, there at the same time doing the same thing. Um, You know, you may have noticed from Doug's show, he has many, many more actual interviews with the participants than I do. Um, that's because I was in there in the conference room listening to, to presentations and taking notes uh, for most of the weekend, for most of the uh, presenters. And, of course, many of them, you know, don't always match my interests. You know, and the assassination is a very individual thing. You know, there's many, many things that interest different people. There's many different theories that interest different people. And while I might not subscribe to all of them, you know, I went into the weekend uh, very open-minded on some things. Uh, And, you know, in the past, I've, you know, made my feelings on certain aspects of the assassination research uh, known but like I said, I'm not, I'm not set in stone, you know, I've had, you know, ideas about the assassination that have been changed. Um, for instance, you know, I used to think Lee Oswald was just an innocent, uh, patsy that he had nothing to do with anything, didn't know anything about anything. Okay, and in in the course of further investigation, further research, you know, I, I I've become convinced that uh, that Lee Oswald was a low level agent of the, of our government, and that he might have known something about things that were going on. Now that's not to say I think he was up on the sixth floor shooting, because I don't, because the evidence doesn't support that. Uh, but I don't think he was a choir boy either or totally innocent of, 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 of everything. You know, he might've been on the right side of, of justice, you know, at least he thought he was. And, uh, he was definitely used, uh, as a scapegoat and framed for this, this murder of, of our 35th president that I'm definitely sure of. Um, But anyway, back to the conference. Um, So yeah, Um, this individual proceeded to correct me on, I I couldn't even tell you how many, however many points you can fit in a seven page email. Okay. It was like, you know, I talked about this individual, maybe not even for 15 minutes. Okay. On the podcast, but somehow he managed to write a seven page email tearing me apart. That I got every detail wrong, everything wrong. That I'm a horrible note taker. I've got no business, uh, you know, covering covering these presentations. I've got I've got no business broadcasting a podcast, and you know, I could go on. It, it was very, very nasty, very, very derogatory. You know, it, it'd be one thing if if I had, um, in earnest, tore this guy a new asshole. Okay. Or blatantly um, misrepresented his presentation, 
But like I said before, I took notes. Okay. But here's the thing. When you take notes, sometimes you miss things. Okay. When you're taking, actually taking the notes of something somebody just said, you might miss what they say right after that, you know, or, or you come across another point right at the end of where you're writing and you have to immediately write down another point. Of course, I don't know how it is when anybody else takes notes, but when I take notes, I do it in a, in a bullet point fashion. Uh, they're not complete sentences. They're not complete thoughts. They are just notes, you know, and to, you know, recite from memory many days removed uh, from the actual presentation and rely totally on my notes is uh, a difficult task. And I told everybody in the podcast that these are from the notes, okay? You know, and the guy was very, very nitpicky about certain details. And like I said, it would be one thing if I had blatantly, you know, vehemently, intentionally screwed up his presentation narrative, but that's not the case. And those of you that heard 32... The OG 32, you know that that's not the case. But like I said, instead of instead of arguing about it and, and whatnot, that show has been deleted. And if you want to know what those presenters had to say, go buy the DVD when it comes out. Okay? Because obviously, you know, doing that type of thing is not my forte. You know, it's uh, it's a lot easier to get it straight from the horse's mouth. So... For that, I apologize uh, to the presenters and to the listeners. And uh, I was going to go ahead and and get into uh, Doug Horn and Judith Baker and what they presented. But due to uh, everything that recently happened, I'm not going to do that. Um, What I can tell you is go listen to Doug Campbell's podcast, The Dallas Action He has many, many great interviews with a lot of the speakers. And if you'd like to hear it straight from their mouth, uh, go right ahead. Um, I'd like to think that I could do Doug Horn's presentation justice on the medical evidence. But uh, you know what? It's out there in in many, many places. And uh, he actually did an interview on Jim Fetzer's radio show that was pretty much verbatim of his presentation. And I'm going to put a link up for that at the 22 November Network. And if you'd like to hear basically what he said at the conference, you can go listen to this this link. He was on Fetzer's show for like two hours. So, and it's basically verbatim of of what he presented at the conference in D.C. uh, two weekends ago. So if you'd like to hear that, I'll put that link up. And you can go check it out for yourself. And you can hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh... I think everybody pretty much knows where Judith Baker is coming from on all this. Uh, the main focus of her presentation in D.C. was about David Ferry. And uh, Doug has an excellent interview with Judith Baker up. And uh, if you'd like to hear what she said, I suggest you go listen to that or wait for the DVD. So, in lieu of all that, uh, we're just going to move on. And... What I'd like to talk about today is Marguerite Oswald. That's right. The accused assassin's mother. Now, Marguerite Oswald, uh, not a perfect person by any sense of the words, grossly, well, I won't say she was misrepresented by the media of the time, Hell, even the media now, if you watch Parkland, uh, you can see how they how they portray Marguerite Oswald as a, a crazy, pain-in-the-ass loon. Um, and that was the prevailing attitude of, of, of much of law enforcement and uh, the media back then as well, that she was crazy. And 
it was important for them to paint her in this light because she liked to she liked to tell anyone that would listen that her son was in fact an agent for the government. Okay? Now she never did specify oh he was CIA, he was he was working for the FBI. You know, she blatantly says it to anyone that would listen that he was innocent and that he was uh, an agent of, the, of of our government. And anybody who's looked into this case um, probably has the same conclusions as that, as what Marguerite Oswald had to say. And I will say this, from day one, she always had her son's back. She never believed that he was the sole assassin or even the assassin of the president. Um, she always believed that the president was shot from the front. Um, and I went back and read a lot, of, a lot of uh, interviews with, with her done by various, uh, mainly newspaper guys who would, who would get sent on these assignments to go uh, interview Marguerite. And Marguerite loved to talk. I'm sure she was quite a lonely woman who was obviously, I guess like anyone would have been back then, disillusioned by her experiences in life in general. Um, because you have to remember, um, the marriage to Lee Oswald's dad, Robert Oswald Sr., was I believe her second? I, I want to say it's her, it was her third marriage, but I'm not for definite on that. I think her first one she had no kids. The second one she had, uh, of course, John Edward Pike, and then uh, the third one she had uh, Robert and Lee. And of course, we know Lee's father died um, before he was born, so she was left to raise these three boys by herself. And it doesn't sound like she got a lot of help from her own family. Uh, but the, uh, the other side of the family, the Robert Oswald side, uh, the Moret family in particular in Louisiana, was, was, was very helpful, very supportive of, uh, of Lee and Robert and, and the things they were doing and always, always helped out when they could. And uh, they were always in in the kids' lives, and uh, you know we know. I mean, basically, you know, she had a, she had a tough time raising these three boys, keeping food on the table, doing it all herself. Now it is suspicious to me, as John Armstrong's research has pointed out, how she could afford to move around so much and buy these different houses in New Orleans and and Texas. Uh, on on her salary alone, which is very peculiar. And I won't go so, as so far as to say you know it was being done for her, but it it's just a peculiar aspect of everything. How how you know on her one woman salary, how they could get by and and afford to uh, to uh, buy these new houses and move all the time, unless she was always moving one up. But I don't think that's the case. Anyway. Now. What's also curious to me. Is. The fact that the kids never really wanted anything to do with her. Uh, when John Pike reached reached age. You know he. He was gone. He went in the Air Force. Uh, when Robert was old enough. He, he was gone. He joined the Marines. And, uh, you know, Lee was looked up to his brother, Robert, and he would read his Marine manuals and just count the days until he could join the Marines. And, uh, you know, once the, once these boys hit the uh, armed services, you know, they never looked back, you know, sure. Lee was probably the only one who, who kept in correspondence with his mother. You know, we have plenty of letters as proof of that, even when he was in, uh, Russia, um, 
you know, so it wasn't like once they left, they totally cut her out of their life. You know, that's not the case. You know, maybe she was a bit overbearing. Maybe she was a bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Who knows? And then, of course, it affects children differently. Um, maybe Robert Oswald was doing just fine on his own, didn't want to be bothered with her. Maybe she always asked for money. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but Lee was her baby boy. And, uh, you know, she never did buy the fact that he was the assassin of the president. And, you know, reading about how these, these early uh, journalists w would be able to spend time with her, you know, they got to know her, you know, she was very worried about what other people thought of her. And, uh, this one in particular I was reading, uh, he was with her for a couple weeks. He was, he was going there every day and everything. And it was Christmas time. And he, and he told her, you know, Hey, if, you know, if you don't have any plans for Christmas, uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to take you, take you out to dinner. And of course, Marguerite was never one to turn down any free anything. Um, so she took him up on it. They went out to a steakhouse for dinner, and she even uh, bought him a present, you know, because he has been spending so much time with her, and he was nice to her, respectful, you know, he listened, and uh, she had bought him a couple bars of soap, you know, wrapped it up in a nice little box and everything, and which he thought was nice, very nice, and uh, when they were leaving the restaurant, she told him, hey, uh, c could you kind of walk, you know, about 10 feet behind me on the on the way out to pay she's like i just want to know if everybody's saying uh saying anything about you know that's lee harvey oswald's mother and uh he said yeah sure and so he did and nobody said anything but when they got up to the register to pay she asked him so did anybody say anything and he said yes he said uh he said yes they they, they were all whispering is that is that lee oswald's mother but they really weren't, but, uh, you know, just to placate her, he told her they were, and he said that that was his Christmas present to her, just to feed her ego a little bit, I guess. Um, but that gives you a little bit about what she was, you know, and I've addressed before on here how, how you know, J.D. Tippett's widow, uh, Marina, would, would, would receive uh, checks in the mail, you know, like pity money. And Marguerite did as well. You know, the one reporter stated how he sat there and watched her open up all these envelopes and just pull the checks out, throw the cards to the side, and not even read them. And he's like, are you going to answer all those, right? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, when I get time. You know, and he said that, that just that the first year alone, you know, she was sent almost $6,000. Which, you know, in today's terms, you know, you're looking at, probably $40,000 and that's just you know in the first the first year or so so you know Marguerite was always worried about money uh, and she started you know charging people to interview her you know she's like you know if, if and she which is smart she said you know if my story is going to make people buy your magazine and give you money, then why shouldn't I be comp compensated for my for my time and what I'm giving you? I'm giving you my story. It, you know, you should have to pay for that. And you know, which often happened. You know, she was charging, you know, anywhere from three or four hundred bucks to a thousand bucks. And uh, you know, the one time she she agreed to uh, a certain amount of time for an interview and one picture. And uh, the photographer uh, with the journalist that was doing the interview ended up taking or talking her into, you know, even changing outfits, it took almost a hundred pictures of her in these various poses. Says so she, she really got into it and, you know, made her feel like a, made her feel like an important uh, superstar, you know, like a movie star or something. And, uh, you know, just little things like that, you know, cause, you know, she was very disillusioned after this because, 
you know, nobody was going to hire, you know, the mother of the accused assassin of the president of the United States, you know, to employ. And, uh, you know, she felt she had to do what she had to do. And she relied on, relied on donations much of her life, um, and, and, and social security and disability and, and all the above for her income. And, uh, you know, she never did make it rich and, uh, but, you know, I've got a picture of her standing in front of, a, I guess it's a bookshelf desk. And it was taken, I believe, in the early 70s. And she had amassed a collection. I mean, she had become a researcher of her own right. She had amassed a collection of over 300 books on the Kennedy assassination by the, by the early seventies, she, she managed to get her hands on just about every book that was published or, or, you know, or a magazine article or anything like that. She collected them. She had photographs. She had, you know, all this stuff, you know, she'd become a very formidable researcher in her own right and was hell bent on writing a book. And, I believe there was a manuscript done, and I forget the name of it. I'll, uh, I'll have to check into that. I'll put it in the notes on the uh, 22 November page. Uh, but yeah, she was uh, very, very, you know, contrite woman. She, uh, you know, she opened up a lot. She didn't know anything for certain. Uh, but you know, she'd always said that Lee always talked to her and, uh, you know, opened up with things about her. And when you think about the facts that we do know about the assassination, you know, it all makes sense. You know, I mean, I, what they tell us, you know, about Lee Oswald and his disillusionment with the, uh, with the uh, Marine Corps system or our government system. You know, when he got his early dismissal from the Marine Corps approved, it was to take care of his mother who had injured herself working in a candy store. And of course we all know he was home for about three days before he he made his epic journey, uh, you know, to, to make his way into the, into the, uh, USSR. And if someone was so disillusioned enough with the way our government was being done and, or just, just this disillusioned with the war or what he was doing in the Marine Corps. Okay. Say you don't want to be there anymore. Okay, where do you want to be? Do you want to go home? I would want to go home. Okay, I would want to go home and get my shit together and figure out what the next step is. But Lee Oswald already knew what that next step was. Okay, he had been planning this Russian journey while he was still in the Marine Corps. Okay, the three day layover was just a means to an end to get where he was going to make it look like he was doing something when he was really doing planning on doing something else. And hence the reason that they reversed his, uh, discharge from honorable to dishonorable. Now, Connolly was the secretary of the Navy then. And he would have been the one to sign off on this. Now, of course, we know he's he later became the governor of Texas. Is that a coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. That he was wounded in the uh, firefight. Um, some people point to to that fact as you know. Well, well, Lee Oswald could have still been up there, but his target would have been Connolly and not JFK, because uh, apparently, you know, he didn't have any ill will against JFK. 
But what I li- always like to go back to is is the fact that you know this was a time in America's history where we were communist crazy. You know, we were scared of the communists, or at least this is what was portrayed. You know, we had people digging bunkers in their backyard. We had kids hiding under desks in school. You know, we were making movies about, you know, these crazy communists and and their way of life and the way they were portrayed in the media. And they call it the Red Scare. And much of it was, was, was propagandized by our government, you know, to... To be able to account for our increase in defense spending and and things like that, uh, you know, they always preach about this missile gap. You know, oh, we got to catch up to the Russians and and the uh, the space race. Oh, we got to catch up to the Russians. You know, they're they're ahead of us. You know, we got to have bigger, better, faster rockets. You know, we have to. We can't just be content with with going up into orbit. We got to get to the moon. You know, we got to show them that we are the shit. You know, we're going to have our lander, you know, dressed in gold leaf foil. You know, we're the majestic superpower, not you. You know, and and if you listen to Doug's podcast with uh, Doug Horn, you know, it might not have been that one. But I know it was on Doug's podcast. He 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 would tell the story of how... When the Russians had their May Day parade, you know, they would uh, have the jets fly over, they would land them, then they would change the tail numbers and then send them back up again to make it look like they had more fighters than, than, than what they really did. And, you know, these people that were on the ground over there that was spying, you know, they would, they would come back and say, oh, man, they have like 100 fighters, these particular kind of jet fighters, and they're equipped with this, that, and the other. You know, when in fact, they might have had 10, Okay. And, you know, a lot of their missiles were just empty tubes sitting around. They really didn't have anything. Um, things like that. You know, it was, it was a lot of propaganda. And, it, and it's the same thing goes on today. You know, like with the, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein and his, and his chemical weapons, you know, that, that, that Colin Powell was saying were there that we never found. You know, it's an excuse for us to spend all this money to go to go over there and invade another country and you know we need to have the best planes the best weapons the best ground troops the best uh vehicles the best armor and on and on and on it's an excuse to spend money you know they want to invent boogeymen like al-qaeda and isis and all this other crap and it's an excuse for them to spend money on defense industry contracts and aerospace contracts and it's still going on to this day and it's been going on ever since the end of world war ii after that lull of world war ii you know when we didn't have an enemy anymore okay hitler's done japan's done okay who else is going to rise up and be a threat to us you know well, now it's Russia, these crazy communists. You know, they're not afraid of anything. You know, they eat their own children. Look at them. You know, they would tell you anything to get you scared. All they have, 100 nuclear weapons. They could drop a bomb on us at any time. They got missiles that can reach D.C. They got missiles in Cuba. It's, it's a giant scare tactic that allows them, gives them carte blanche to spend whatever they want to spend to make these rich people richer than God ever imagined. Okay, and it's still going on to this day. We see it now. Getting back to Lee Oswald for a minute, you know, like I said, his trip to Russia was planned before he even left the Marine Corps. You know, he had talked about and sent an application to the Albert Schweitzer College or some some nonsense in Helsinki, Finland, I think, or. Sweden, I don't even know where the hell it was, but anyway, you know, it had been planned, this, this, this whole thing, and there's good evidence that, you know, he was trained in Russia at the Monterey School of Languages, uh, 
you know, there's evidence that his his famous Russian diaries weren't really written by him. You know, there's 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 fingerprints of intelligence all over everything that he does. You know, from the time he defects to the time he's killed. You know, there's fingerprints of intelligence. You know, like I said before on the podcast, you know, he was part of Operation Redskin. The CIA was sending people into Russia to defect them, to learn what they could learn. They were doing it with multiple people who looked similar in appearance. You know, like Robert Webster and people that had different backgrounds that could possibly be, you know, that the Russians possibly could think they could use. But the Russians weren't stupid, okay? They knew exactly what was going on. You know, so they stuck Lee Oswald's ass in Minsk at a stupid radio factory, you know, for two years and let him, let him linger, okay? They didn't kick him out of the country. He asked to leave. Okay, he figured, you know, all right, this is enough. There's nothing else I'm going to glean from being over here and, and living this life. It's time to go back. They let him go back, and B, we let him come back. Okay, this should have been viewed at this time period in our history as a treasonous act, what he did. Okay, especially being a former Marine to defect to the United uh, or the or the USSR. And, and claim to have secrets of the U-2 spy plane to give them. And, and radar call signs and, and all whatever. He should have been treated as a traitor. And arrested as soon as he came back. But what happens? Okay. It comes out now, thanks to Joan Mellon, that he was debriefed by the CIA when he returned. He brought back all kinds of crap. He brought back all kinds of pictures. He was given money by the State Department to come back. To get back to Texas. Okay. And nothing said or done with him or followed up on. You know, he's, he's, he's allowed to go back to leading a normal life here in the United States. But we know that's not true either. We know that they were always watching him. He was always a tool to be used. Okay, and like Oswald's mother said, he was good at what he did. Okay, he might not have been the best, he wasn't the worst, but he was always good at what he did. Okay, and back to Oswald's mother for a minute. Um, you know, Marguerite, yeah. She might have been a little crazy. Yeah, she might have been opportunistic. You know, yeah, she might have been looking out for herself. But there was nobody else to look after her. After the assassination, Robert Oswald cuts ties with her. Marina cuts ties with her. She wouldn't even allow Marguerite to see her own grandkids. Marina's kids didn't figure out who their dad was until they were in like high school. And I mean, can you imagine finding that out when you're in high school who you who your real dad is? I mean, that's crazy. You know? And Robert and Marina you know, no contact whatsoever after the assassination, still to this day. You know, she wouldn't let her kids see their uncle. Or Robert wouldn't wouldn't let her his kids see their aunt or their cousins. You know, it's I don't know what happened to create that giant rift. You know, I've got some theories. Everybody's got theories, you know. Was the Lee Oswald that came back from Russia the real Lee Oswald? You know, is this why Robert didn't want to have anything to do with Marina or him? You know, is this why Lee told Robert in jail when Robert was looking into his eyes that you'll not find anything there, brother? And then why Robert said when he was leaving the jail... That's not my brother. 
Now, people can take that as a meta- metaphorical meaning, you know, like, you know, I don't, I don't know how my brother could do something like that. You know, that's not my brother. Or a literal meaning, that's not my brother, you know. But then, you know, they're scared and threatened into not revealing that fact. Because you have to, you have to understand that there was a big age gap between them, you know, three or four years. There was three or four years where they didn't even see each other, you know, while Oswald was in the Marine Corps and then and then in Russia. You know, so if he hadn't seen Lee Oswald since he was probably fifteen or sixteen, you imagine how much a child could change from the time uh, from that time until they're like 22 a lot you might not even recognize your own brother or someone that looks vaguely similar could maybe be passed as your brother because you wouldn't know what kind of person they were you know what i'm saying like you wouldn't know how they acted or their quirks or you know whatever or it could just be the, you know, they, the Robert and Marina had a little fling at right after that and then realized they were doing something totally wrong and then never spoke to each other again. I don't know. Anything could be possible. But uh, like, like one article I read, they called her the unsinkable Marguerite Oswald. And uh, she was until her dying day. You know, she kept up correspondence. She she talked to reporters. She talked to anybody that would listen. You know, she never did get to write that book uh, and get it published the way she wanted to. And I would have liked to have read that book, most definitely. Um, but, you know, no real revelations. Everybody wanted something from her. Uh, she just wanted companionship. She wanted the truth about her son and she wanted everyone to know that she was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother and uh, I think she accomplished it but anyway that's it for this week on the Lone Gummin Podcast this is your boy Rob Clark and once again thank you everyone for listening check out 22 November Network wordpress.com for all your up to date JFK research stuff. We've got some great bloggers. We've got some great articles. We've got some great podcasts. Make sure you check out my boy Doug Campbell. Make sure you're checking out Black Op Radio. Make sure you're checking out Down the Rabbit Hole with Popeye. All right, these are all great shows. That's it for me. This one's in the can to the satellite, beam down directly to your ears. This is Rob Clark, sounding good, out.